Aloha, I am Christy Chadwick. I have a master's in deaf education from Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. During my program, I learned alongside audiologists to learn more about the science of the ear and also how devices work, such as hearing aids and cochlear implants. With this, I learned a method called listening and spoken language, or LSL. Now living in Hawaii, I run an organization called Hawaii Hears. My mission is to deliver services to families who have children diagnosed with hearing loss, who use hearing aids and cochlear implants. I also provide education and awareness to professionals in early intervention around language development for children who are deaf or hard of hearing. The main focus of Hawaii Hears is to provide support to families to empower them and help them get what they need to be able to communicate with their child. In this series, we hear uh, from audiologists, teachers of the deaf, parents of children who are deaf, and individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing. If you want to learn more about my services or what Hawaii Hears offers, please visit hawaiihears.com. You can also donate by clicking the donate button at hawaiihears.com. Mahalo. This is an interview featuring Dori Knoll. She was a professor of mine at Washington University. And since then, she has now uh, moved to Canada for um, pursuing her PhD and learning more about early intervention and how that looks for the families and how it can be impactful and effective for both families and the early interventionist practitioner. Also, Dory is a mom of a child who is deaf. He is now 21. His interview is also featured in this series. I will we'll link to it um, in the notes below so that you can also watch that one. But in this interview, Dory tells her story um, about finding out that her son has a profound hearing loss when he was just over one year. And it tells a little bit about the story that she and her husband um, went through of the guilt and the confusion of uh, finding out that their son had a hearing loss and the lengths that they went to get the information that they needed in order to cope and comprehend what they could do for their child and what it's like to raise a child who is deaf. So this interview is for families, parents, and early interventionists alike. And feel free to leave your comments and questions below. And I hope you enjoy this video. All right, hi, Dory. Hi. Hi, thank you so much for joining me today and getting to share your experience. I think it's really important for us to hear um, what, 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 what it was like for you as a parent, a mom finding out that your son was deaf, and then also where you went from there, because you are a teacher of the deaf, you were a professor of mine at Washington University, and I learned a lot about early intervention from you. So it will be awesome for you to share all of that. So let's start just first with um, your perspective as a mom and how, how it was for you to find out that your son had a hearing loss. Yes, um, my son is now 21, so he's a young adult, and he was diagnosed um, actually before newborn hearing screening. So he was born, was not screened at birth, we actually did not find out until he was 13 months old. Um, and that was sort of at my insistence because the doctor kept telling us, oh, he's a boy, boys always talk late, he's fine, he's really smart, he follows along. Um, he was really good at fooling us, we found out. Mm. Um, so even though we pushed for trying to figure out what was going on, we recognized that there was something not quite right it still was a shock to find out that he was profoundly deaf um, both ears, probably from birth, we think. Um, so it still came as a huge shock. And I think something that was a little bit different for us than maybe for parents who are, babies who are diagnosed in newborn hearing screening is we had 
a lot of guilt of how could we not have known? We've known him for a year. We've been his parents. I'm with him all the time. How could we not know? So there was a lot of um, sadness, grief, guilt that came along with that. Um, it's a pretty intense season. Right. Absolutely. And what was the moment that you really knew that something wasn't right? What was going on with, with Jake that initially set I, that off? I think it was sort of a gradual, I noticed little things. Um, we were in like a mommy and me play group and I started to notice um, the older he got, the closer to one that he got, he made lots of sounds. He babbled a ton, but his sounds weren't the same as the other kids. So he did a lot of sounds that I now know that he could feel, you know, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so he did, m -m 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 -m, you know, that kind of lots of sort of guttural sounds. Um, and little things like he was very focused on an activity. So he could sit in the kitchen. I had a little Tupperware cabinet that he could play in while I was cooking. And he would just stay laser focused on that for 30, 40 minutes. And I now know that he couldn't hear us. So he didn't have any distractions. Um, there were other things though that kind of, um, kind of made us doubt that something was wrong because we lived in an older home with really old hardwood floors. And um, if he was sitting on the floor and we walked into the room, a lot of times he would turn around like he had heard us come into the room. Mm -hmm. And we later realized that he must have felt the floor move. Mm -hmm. um, he was very, very perceptive. He watched our faces a lot. So he did things like reacting to, you know, um, our emotions. He would cry if we were upset, those kinds of things. The things that you, as a parent, assume your child is hearing, he was watching. So there were things that made us suspect and then things that made us go, mm, he's probably fine. He's just different than the other kids. I don't know. Right. Yeah. And then about the time where they're supposed to start developing words and language is before a year. And, and at that point, did you start to wonder, like, why isn't he talking? What's, where's his Absolutely. language? Mm -hmm. um, he did not have any words at one. Mm -hmm. um, and the closer he got to one, the more different his vocalization sounded to me than the other kids. And all the other kids started saying words. And, you know, even just the ones that weren't talking yet were babbling a variety of sounds. And he never did that. Um, it was always the same sound over and over again. He never did the, like, reduplicated babble. That's, he did the reduplicated babble. He didn't do the varied. Um, so... Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, we just kind of knew that there, there was just something like a gut feeling that something was wrong. I think in our minds, we thought, well, maybe he's missing out on a tone or a pitch of sound, but we really were not prepared for a diagnosis of profound hearing loss. Mm -hmm. Right. So the diagnosis came and mm -hmm. That came because you finally got a referral from your pediatrician to go see an audiologist or an ENT had to come first? Um, we actually, I'm not sure how the strings were all pulled, but we had to drive two hours. So we saw everybody on one day. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we lived in California at the time, we lived in Monterey and we drove to San Francisco and it just was, um, I don't even remember which person we saw first, but we saw audiologists and ENT on that day. Mm -hmm. So we were fortunate in that regard. Yeah, you got to see everything all at once and, and get the diagnosis quick. Um, yes. And then were there initial thoughts to um, put hearing aids on him? What, what were the initial steps after that the diagnosis came? Yes, um, they right away started talking about hearing aids. And that in itself was a shock to us because we had never seen a child with hearing aids. I mean, the only experience we had with hearing aids were you know, my grandpa, you know, old men that had lost their hearing. That's kind of the, the stereotype that we had of that's who needs hearing aids. So they started talking about hearing aids and it was very um, confusing and upsetting also because also, especially back then, the high powered hearing aids were much bigger than they are now. And so I'm like, you're going to put those huge things on my little baby's ears. Like, how is that going to work? Um, 
it was it was overwhelming, but they did start talking about hearing aids right away, and they were talking about the importance of um, access to any sort of sound that we could provide for him. So I think they were very um, confident in their recommendation. And I think the way that it was presented to us, there was never a, oh, well, maybe not. It was a, of course, this is what we need to do. This is what's going to be best for him. So we moved forward with hearing aids right away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as a, as a parent finding this out and you're getting all this new information, you're dealing with a little bit with that guilt of, I had no idea anything was going on. And now I'm finding all of this out. What what, what happened? Where did I go wrong? And then you're dealing with a little bit of that confusion of what, what does this mean? Mm -hmm. And what do I do with hearing aids? Where did you find some refuge as a parent? What did, where did you get the information? Where did you find that, that clarity and, and the peace in all of it? I think, again, this is something very different than now. There, the internet was not nearly the vast um, resource that families have now. We did do a lot of our own research, a lot of our own searching. Um, the audiologists were a wealth of information and very, very supportive. And they actually sent us home with a resource binder. Um, and I mean, we just sort of read it cover to cover. We, our way of coping was we were starved for information. We wanted to know as much as we could possibly know so that we would feel um, equipped to make decisions um, for Jake. And so we kind of dove headfirst into as much information as we could get. We checked out books. We, I mean, I think I read um, Choices in Deafness. I think I read that in a weekend. Mm -hmm. And I just remember that being really influential. Um, and shortly after his diagnosis, uh, we were put in contact with the early intervention system in California where we were. And that system actually had like a parent connect kind of program. Um, and there was a mom that I was able to connect with. Her child was a little bit older, but I could ask all those questions of, you know, what do you do if he falls asleep? Do you take the hearing aids? Out, or do you leave them in because then if you take them out then he's gonna think it's okay to take them out those kinds of questions that that only another parent really can reassure you mm -hmm. um, and also that mom was very encouraging that you know he's gonna get used to them he's gonna not take them out every 30 seconds at some point you're you're going to get over this initial hump that was huge for us um, and then the hospital also had like a parent support group connection. Um, that was tricky for us because we lived so far away, but we did go for a couple of meetings um, with other parents, but we, we kind of sought that out, but um, it was difficult to find in that small sort of community. Mm -hmm. And like I said, there was not a lot of online resources. So there weren't Facebook groups, there weren't other ways to connect with parents, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so let's fast forward a little bit, and um, rather than going through the therapy that Jake received and how his process was, because actually mm -hmm. I have a chat with Jake, and he'll be featured in this series as well. So I want to learn a little bit more about you and how um, you came from a parent trying to learn all this information, and you coped through mm -hmm. getting information. Mm -hmm. I mean, parents cope in all different ways. Some, pe some, some parents need that space mm -hmm. and a little bit of time to process. Um, but you wanted the information and then later on you became a teacher of the deaf to help mm -hmm. other kids. So how old was Jake when you became a teacher of the deaf? I went back to school to get my master's when he was seven. So it was a two-year program. So he was nine when I became a teacher of the deaf. And I think that journey came from, again, us seeking knowledge, um, me trying to provide for him the best environment that we could to ensure that he would get the most success. He has a cochlear implant. And so our sort of decision was if we're going to go through with this and have, if we're going to do it, we're going to do it all in. So um, we learned everything that we could learn about, um, you know, listening environment and communication techniques and all these things. And um, there came a time when it was time for Jake to go to school and he was three and there was a specialized program. By this time, 
my husband was in the army. I forgot to say that we had moved to the DC area mm-hmm. and, um, there was a school in the DC area, um, that is kind of specialized school that provided services for kids with hearing loss. And so I started taking him to school every day and it was pretty far away from home. So I volunteered at the school and that in itself was kind of a pivotal moment for me because I got to connect with the people that knew all of the knowledge that I wanted. And so I got to go to professional development days. Eventually they hired me actually. Um, And I got to meet and connect with all of these people that had this wonderful expertise. And so they actually played a big role in encouraging me to go back to school. And they said, you, you could totally do this. And so um, a f- it took a few years because I had my daughter in, in the middle of all of that. So, um, but when Jake was seven, I finally decided to just go for it and um, have a look back. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So when you initially graduated with your master's, did you go into early intervention right away or did you work in the schools? Um, how did that look when you graduated? Yes, um, I knew that early intervention was what I wanted to do. And I think the biggest thing for me was the early interventionist that worked with us, with Jake, was so influential in our lives and made such an impact on us. And um, she was so encouraging and supportive and she didn't just provide information she provided support and she was just this amazing woman and so i went into the program thinking okay i want to do that for other families i want to be that for other families and so i loved my practical rotations in the classroom and i did an itinerant rotation and i knew that i would be fine wherever i ended up because i just loved the teaching aspect as well, but I knew that really my heart was in early intervention. So that was my end goal. And I was fortunate enough to um, get a position right away in early intervention. So that's what I spent my entire career doing. Yeah. Yeah. Early intervention is definitely that initial point where we get contact with parents as they're comprehending, coping, understanding, figuring this all out. Mm -hmm. Um, What was what was your initial thought in um, wanting to provide early intervention or what, what did you uh, end up doing as you provided an early intervention? I think um, I felt like I had a particular empathy for the parents that maybe someone who hadn't gone through this had. And I had to learn some hard lessons there because not every family coped the way that I coped. Mm. Not every family did things the way that I thought they should do things. So I, I had to learn a really big lesson in being non-judgmental and still supportive. Um, But I just felt like I, I could look at a parent and say, my situation is not the same as yours, but I know what it feels like to be told that your child has something wrong, that it's not what you expected, this is not what you signed up for, you don't want all these specialists, you don't want to learn what an audiogram is, you don't want any of this because you didn't ask for it. Mm-hmm. So I, I feel like that was kind of my driving force, that empathy, um, and I truly wanted to help parents, um, maybe even particularly parents that didn't cope the way that I did, mm-hmm. I wanted them to sort of come around to that point of wanting to become an advocate and empowering them to do what they needed to do for their child. Yeah. So what would you tell a parent who was coping in a different way, maybe taking a longer amount of time to process, not able to look at the information? What would you tell them to sort of pique their interests and want them to get the information in a way? I think um, one of the things that I always encouraged parents to do is um, connect with other parents. I think that was um, really pivotal for us and so I think seeing that other parents were able to cope and they were doing okay especially parents that maybe were a little bit farther along in the process um, because that was so beneficial to me to see wow it's not always going to be this hard Um, I would always encourage parents that were really overwhelmed to maybe try to connect with another parent and sometimes they they were so overwhelmed that even that was too much to ask. So I just tried to be supportive and give them what they needed when they needed it and how they needed it. Um, and I just think the biggest thing was I let them know that, you know, I'm not 
I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to stop showing up. I'm going to help you get past this point of figuring out what you need to do for next steps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Take it little steps at a time. Yes. So did you have a huge toolkit to draw from as you uh, introduce new information to the families? You say that you met them where they were, mm -hmm. in the way that they were. So what were some of the tools that you offered to them? Um, some families liked handouts. Um, they liked websites, resources. They liked to read things. Other families wanted um, sort of hands-on, let's try this strategy with your child and see what he can do. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the things that I always wanted to do was sort of, I did not want to come in as the expert and be the person with all of the information. I wanted to impart that information on the families. So I never wanted the child to do something for me like, oh, he made that sound. Did you hear that? He did that for me. I wanted him to do it for the parents. And so trying to encourage that, but even just pointing out those little, little tiny moments of progress and celebrating with the families was really, really big for me. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes families needed me to uh, show them first. Sometimes it took them a little bit of time to warm up and want to sort of get in there and play and do it. Other families were so quick to, to say, okay, I got it. Let me try. Mm -hmm. um, so I just tried to individualize the type of um, information sharing that I would do, although the strategies essentially were the same. Some families got a little further along in the process as far as a little more higher level strategies. Maybe their child was um, had less severe of a, of a hearing loss and that, that child was moving faster. So we could go a little farther with language strategies and things like that. So the strategies themselves essentially were the same um, for everyone, but how I went about providing that information was different for every single family. Mm -hmm. Right. And it, it varies so much across what is happening with the child, what degree of hearing loss, um, mm -hmm. how they're incorporating the listening and spoken language, um, mm -hmm. if there's sign involved, yes. what's going on with the parents, what's going mm -hmm. on in this with the support of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, is there one sort of challenge that you noticed throughout your time as an early interventionist that you could speak to? I think um, universally among all of my colleagues, the, the topic that came up the most was consistency of device use. Mm -hmm. And I think um, that was just a challenge, even for families that were, you know, the entire spectrum, families that were very educated and they sort of knew they were supposed to be putting them on, um, to families that were just so overwhelmed that that was the last thing on their mind. I think that, um, trying to help parents understand that it's about brain development and that their child is missing something, even if they don't have full access to sound. I think one of the biggest challenges was a child that was profound um, with hearing aids that he didn't get any benefit from, and they were just waiting for a cochlear implant. So trying to help that mom understand that it's worth the effort, it's worth um, trying to keep those auditory pathways open, um, and I think that's, that's kind of the bottom line is, is convincing parents that it's worth the effort because it is not easy to keep hearing aids on a child. Yeah. Yeah. And you know that from experience personally with your son, I'm sure. And um, are there any sort of tricks of the trade to keep hearing aids on or cochlear implants, even when they get an implant? Mm -hmm. um, we, we did a lot of, we would recommend like retention devices. So um, maybe a clip that would keep the hearing aids from falling all the way to the floor if the child took them out. Um, we used little pilot caps to tie around the hearing aids, which are not going to keep the hearing aids in, but they might keep the little hands out or at least give them enough enough of an obstacle that, you know, someone can intervene. Um, and I, I really think the biggest thing is just, um, I kind of told parents that it, it needs to become, in their mind, it needs to become a non-negotiable. So your kid might really, really hate the car seat, but if safety is a concern, that's a non-negotiable. You'll strap them in even if they're screaming, right? So helping parents understand that if you think that the hearing aids are non-negotiable, 
eventually the child will stop fighting. Um, you just have to get through that point of if he throws a fit for 10 minutes and then you give in, he just got what he wanted and you reinforced the behavior that you're trying to overcome. So um, just little kind of behavior tricks, things like that, um, distracting a child, give him something to eat while you're putting his hearing aids on so his hands are busy. Um, make it fun, sing a song that you only sing when you put the hearing aids on. As soon as they turn on, or the cochlear implant, as soon as they turn on, you get to sing that, their favorite song. Mm -hmm. Little things like that. Um, kind of little behavior strategies, really, because I think the biggest thing is that we're trying to stop the behavior of taking them off all the time. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a, that makes a lot of sense. And it's, um, you know, one thing for us as, as teachers to say, this is uh, an idea and this is the behavior, but then putting it into practice all day, every day is I'm sure very challenging. So it's nice to hear that you had that challenge and that struggle as a parent, and then we're able to implement the strategies to make it, make it work long-term for you and for, for Jake. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So tell me more about what you're doing right now. You're no longer in St. Louis. Right. Where are you living? Uh, we live in Ottawa, Canada. Okay. Um, we had the opportunity to move here for my husband's job. And it is a four-year rotation for him. So we knew we were only going to be here four years. So um, I took that opportunity to pursue my PhD. So I am working on my PhD at the University of Ottawa. Awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. How's it been? How, what are you studying? So I am actually about to start my own research. I'm two years in. Hopefully we'll finish in four. That's the goal. Mm -hmm. um, but I am looking at that coaching relationship between the early intervention provider and the parent and what that sort of looks like in our really specialized field. There's a lot of research and a lot of um, professional recommendations and things to support that in early intervention in general with kids with any type of hearing loss. And I'm interested in specifically looking at children, um, families that are pursuing listening and spoken language and whether or not coaching looks the same um, in our field of practice as it does in the general early, early intervention world. Mm -hmm. And there really has not been any research on that. So um, my, my research is qualitative, it's exploratory in nature. I want to get the perspectives of the practitioners and the parents and just get a better understanding of what coaching looks like in this practice. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where I'm going with it. Right. Yeah. Early intervention is very broad in terms of the, um, the different modalities. So you have the occupational therapist, the physical therapist, the speech language pathologist. Um, here in Hawaii, we have care coordinators who are mostly um, social workers and and the Hawaii has just opened up coaching, the coaching model, only to a few agencies around the state. Um, you know, some of the agencies are still working on that uh, same model of bringing toys in and working with the families. Um, mm -hmm. So we're just transitioning into a coaching model. Um, there's been some confusion on how to implement it in, in every regard, but especially with kids who are deaf, it's, it's sort of this, um, this gap of how do I show the family without telling them what, what does it look like to um, coach a family through something without giving it all away. Mm -hmm. So what is your recommendation, especially like um, in St. Louis, I remember learning this from you in our early intervention courses of what it looks like. Um, but maybe talk a little bit more about your experience from before as an early interventionist and then what you kind of are learning now too. So I actually sort of going into this practice, I, I guess because I have the perspective of a mom, my goal was always to empower, empower the parents. And so I was never, um, I didn't ever sort of do bring the toy bag in. I'm going to be the expert and show you. Um, I just, that wasn't my philosophy. And I think because as a mom, I was empowered. So I wanted to empower parents. 
Um, I think that when you have a child with hearing loss, there's so many things that are sort of out of your control and you didn't ask for any of this. So if an early intervention provider can come in and say, okay, I believe that you can learn this and I believe that you know your child better than I know your child or better than anyone knows your child. So the best person to implement these strategies is you. So I may come in with the knowledge of the strategies, but the parents are the expert on their child. So um, really just, it's a mindset shift to, to a certain extent because it's really about, yes, we have all of these tools and tricks and things that we can do and it's easier if you come in with your plan and your toy bag and it's much more controlled. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if we learn to trust the families a little bit more and see sort of the end result, keep the end result in mind of, I want to leave these, this family with more information and I want to equip them to become advocates for their child because I'm not always going to be there. Birth to three, early intervention is generally birth to three. Um, but then also, aside from that, even if I'm coming in once a week for an hour, I want the family to have tools that they can use all of the rest of the week when I'm not there to help their child develop language. So I think that whether it's listening in spoken language or sign, if it's only limited to one hour per week, the family's really not, the family's not going to learn what they need to learn and therefore the child isn't going to learn what, the, what they need to learn. So um, I've always been a proponent of that. I think um, over the years that I've been in practice, that has evolved quite a bit. Um, I think that there are lots of places that are still sort of coming around to that idea of coaching. And um, it's, it's difficult to transition from the direct therapy model, I think, um, for a lot of people because they know that it works. They know that I can teach this skill to this child and I have my toys and I know how to use them and I know exactly what I'm going to do from the beginning of the session to the end and when you go in without a toy bag you're sort of at the mercy of the environment um, what toys you can find to use sometimes there aren't toys so you have to be really creative of how can I teach this strategy using you know whatever is around me in this family's home um, it, it takes a different type of thinking I think yeah absolutely have you learned anything um, new in your time in school that has changed that perception a little bit or maybe enforced it? Definitely um, enforced it. I think the thing that surprised me a little bit is that really the only literature out there on coaching in listening and spoken language practice is um, basically professional recommendations, um, policy documents of, of this is what we believe um, families should be empowered to teach their child. There really hasn't been any research on does it work. Um, so I think in my mind it works and as I've gone through this process I've kind of learned a little bit. I think my, sh my thinking has shifted a little bit to I know this works and I'm convinced of this model to sort of having a little bit more of a, an, a mindset of let's see how this goes. And I'm going to, I think it works, but let's see what happens. Um, I think that just uh, trying to go into my research open-minded and um, willing to learn mm -hmm. uh, because I know what I know as a practitioner. And now I'm trying to put on this hat of a researcher and look at a topic that really hasn't been explicitly studied before. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of exciting. And I'm prepared to learn what I don't expect to find, mm -hmm. really. So I think that's how my perspective has shifted, that, that I, I really am very curious and interested to find out what it is that I learn. And it may be very different than what I'm expecting. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, very fascinating. I love research in general. So I look forward to hearing about how the research goes over the next couple of years. And maybe we'll check in and do another video chat to see what, what new information you've learned or enforced, reinforced. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. And thanks for sharing your perspective as a parent and as a teacher and an educator.
You are very welcome. It was my pleasure.